Welcome everybody. Have you ever read a paper where everything is indexed? Or if you've looked at formulas in say calculus books and they have a sub i sub one, one of these things that happens often is that we start out with a strategy that works locally well and then we're wed to it as we develop our technology, add more tools to it, this notation starts to add up and it shows a certain crack in the thinking of how we set this problem up. This is a little lecture on how to plan ahead to avoid some of those classic mistakes. It's one of many solutions. The one I'm focusing on is one that helps us interface with how we might program some of the formulas we would eventually make. So take a look at these formulas. Right now, the wrong idea would be to worry about what anything here means. Just look at them visually. Certainly the most impressive use of notation would be something like this. We see this in books on index calculus. They're not always this expanded, but it certainly does occur. It's very difficult for not only a reader to guess what the meaning is, but even to read this. Remember, these are slides, so it's blown up on your screen. When you're reading this in a text, it's very small print. You can be forgiven for making a simple calculation error just because you misread it. And it's not just the errors we're trying to avoid, we're truly trying to make people think about the problem in a clear way what really matters when we put this notation in. So let's take a look at what we could do to simplify some of these ideas. And what I want to plant in your mind is that the reason these occur is a misunderstanding of what indices are for. In particular, there's an implied suggestion that indices order information, but there's no order involved. It's just an old fashioned idea connected to some of the things you did in say a calculus class where you thought of sequences as being ordered. We'll see that there's no order necessary. If we move to code, you'll see immediately that you can't program this. Depending on your background in programming, what I want you to think about is that we're defining a function called make space that's going to take in a parameter k, say the field we want to build a vector space over, and then a bunch of different dimensions. Now, whatever this function is doing is irrelevant. What I want to point out is that we're thinking of this input as requiring multiple dimensions, d1 through dl. But that l could vary as we move through the program. Different users will have different number of legs on their tensors, for example. With that extension, it's difficult to see how to program this. Now, some programming languages do have special tools to help us with this, such as variadic inputs and dependent types. I don't want to get into really technical technology. I just want to say this is not a natural thing to sit down and write a program for. And that's a hint that perhaps the mathematical use of this type of notation is also a bit fractured. So let's take on the simplest solution. At times, the only reason you have multiple inputs is because you're going to apply them to one simple function at the very start and then use it in that combined form. So for example, if what I want to create is the vector space of dimension d1 times all the way through dl, then I may as well simply decide to call that the variable d. This is called indirection. When I first take a piece of the formula and I pull out a piece of it, name it something, and then apply it. This simplifies my thought into two steps. Once I know that d is the product, I no longer have to revisit what those individual di's are. I have that single value captured as the letter d, and I compute the vector space of that dimension as a separate task. This is often your easiest solution. But at times we do need to hold on to the individuality of these multiple inputs. Take for example a system like this. We'll later call this the tensor product, for now, you can just think of it as a way of gluing together multiple terms that each individually depend on these multiple inputs of varying degrees. What we could do, however, is we could still do that in direction. Only now, instead of coming up with a single number, we'll come up with a set. We'll say the set of d1 through dl. And now, instead of having to write multiple values in the exponent, we're simply going to extract that entire operator to the front and label it like you would in a calculus class with sigmas we put the notation subscript underneath that one operator to say range over all these values. Now while we're at it, why don't we take an extra step? Why not actually abstract the things we're going to use? That is, we don't have to give the formula k to the d. We could simply call that an abstract term v and let the set be the things we want to create. This is an important step when you're thinking of simplifying your notation. It's also an important step when you're programming. When you separate these two tasks, you allow a program to become easily parallelized. We could have had a step before us compute all these individual v's as k to the d's and then apply their tensor product in this case. 
that might be a faster process than keeping them separate and doing all the work at once. At the end of the day, you end up with a notation that is at least more slim. Now, I want to be cautious about the notation at the very end of this. This notation here takes a bit more practice and be quick to confuse. It's appropriate to start using when you've had a little bit of warm up. For now, I would recommend if you've not used much in direction, start using this type of notation for a while. Get comfortable with it and then start dropping the subscripts on that operator and you'll have a clean setup. If we look back at our coding example, we'll see how this actually looks. If we take our original sentence up here, trying to create a space that depends on multiple parameters d1 through dl, where l keeps varying along with the d's, we'll now say, well, in a previous step, we created the right set of these d's. I've illustrated with user constants. This dot 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 here is not meant to be part of the program. It's meant to have been given the actual values the user wants. Once I have that set, I simply pass in a very clean function, the parameter k and the set ds. This is quite similar to the notation circle times script k and d. With that notation, you get all the information in a compact format. It's often the case that the best notation is one that can transfer between different ways of thinking. So if you think about how you program your notation, you'll often be on the right track because you're giving yourself two shots at what notation you need. Here are three evolving situations. They're somewhat simplistic, but if you replace the plus with a times, or a circle plus, or a circle times, or many other operations, you'll see the pattern seems to reemerge. In the first part, we have just the direct sum, where we've indexed everything in the sum. If that becomes cumbersome, in this case maybe it isn't, but with larger notation uses, it becomes cumbersome, then we can simplify that by extracting all the values into a set x then taking the sum over that x. In time, we can even drop the sum subscripts and simply say sigma x. When we write that in code, we see that the sigma x is precisely what we need to write a decent program. We'll have the x's given to us by whatever operations we care about. That's just like creating this thing. And then we apply a command such as sum xs. Now, a couple of things that'll be useful for those of you who either have or intend to program there are some conventions that you may notice. Whenever we're indexing things, we like to take the elements in the same set uh, notation. So if this is a capital X, we use a lowercase x. This is a very mathematical custom. Sometimes these things have already been named with upper letters. At that point, if we need a capital X as the actual value, then we'll make this function a more scripted style, something like a curly x. In programming languages, variables tend to be written in lowercase and their types, meaning the kind of data they're going to be stored as, will be in uppercase. That's not a permanent convention, but it's a very common one. In that case, in order to pluralize ideas like capital X, you simply add a letter. X becomes X's. A letter Y becomes Y's. So you'll think of little x in X's. Sum of X can also be written in another similar notation. For example, in line 5, we have xs.fold. Fold is a technique that gets after the fact that what we often do when we do repeated operations is a recursion. In the case that this is a list, we just take it apart somewhere. We apply the head, in this case 3, and then we recursively do whatever folding does to the tail, the remaining parts of this set. In this case, we wanted to add. So the add moves into the middle to add the result of the front with the tail, and it's applied recursively. So this is shorthand notation for something that's being done in this sum function, but now it's letting you conveniently replace the word sum with any operation. If you want to now multiply over the set, you just replace the plus with the times. So getting used to that notation can be powerful. Another notation that's often found is trying to mimic logical connectives such as for all. For all is often replaced with an ampersand because it starts with the same and letter that we use in the for all symbol. So if we use this, for all and plus, we mean sum over all the elements in excess. Other notations will, of course, apply. Look at your situation. Now let's get to what's really going on here. The difficult cases are when we have subscripts upon subscripts. These are situations where it becomes very technical writing. Look at this example, which is simplified from our first slide. We had multiple super and subscripts in that case. The easiest thing to do is this form of indirection in two steps. Let's start at the very bottom since that's where the fonts are the smallest. We take that entire list and we call it a tuple. 
i sub star. The star is now replacing the values where a1 through a go. That means our notation has removed the ellipsis of three dots and all this extra. There's still subscripts on subscripts, but it's far more tolerable just in terms of quantity. But let's step aside. What is it that we've actually done? If we look at a tuple i1 dot 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 through ia, it would be clear that what we mean is something inside of a Cartesian product, ordered pairs, ordered triples, so forth. The range of those individual values are, as they sound, individual. For i1, it goes between 1 and d1. For i2, it goes between 1 and d2, and so forth. That notation we've already seen we could simplify. If we think of this more generally as just taking values from a set x1 through xa and taking their Cartesian product, we could abstract over all of these sums and just create our product factors and create a single product over some scripted x. And now x will simply be an element in this product. i sub star is the same sort of structure. Once you realize this, you might even remove the star. And you might even think of this now not as any kind of tuple at all, but simply as a member of this product. That is what's known in the community as a dependent function. It's a function that you give it an input and it gives an output in the corresponding coordinate. It's dependent because that coordinate tells you what values are allowed in that coordinate. So unlike a regular function where an input can give you anything in the output domain, here we're limited by each coordinate. So it's a dependent function. If we put this all together, we find ourselves the most compact notation. We use our functions again. We take our i sub 1s through i sub a's and we replace them with a single operator, yota, which is in the product over some domain. When that's viewed this way, we now see gamma is simply a function that takes in some unique, interesting looking domain, in this case, the product over some set d, into the values we want, in this case, k. And we access this function with a single subscript, yota. It's a function upon functions. If we evolve this over time, we see the relevance to, say, writing a program. Our double super subscripted notation simplifies into simply gamma with a subscript yota and a superscript tau. You can use other letters, of course. And yota and tau are now coming from rich sets themselves. We've separated the work. The user can now think on their own whether they need to worry about the structure of yota. Is it a product of very large sets, small sets, what shapes they have? And that's individualized away from using them in creating the data gamma sub yota. If we write a program, we see the value right away. Instead of needing to have the user provide a fixed list, we might now depend on very subtle structures for this extra input. Yota will now be a function that takes in an input x and produces whatever the appropriate term is, a dependent function. There are many ways to implement this. I've demonstrated it with what's called a lambda meaning it's a function that I can describe in a single line that doesn't depend on outside parameters. You can define this in other ways. That's not the topic here. Once I've described these two functions, I pass these two functions into my gamma function, producing the effect of this. There's actually no fixed inputs here. You won't be able to evaluate this until you evaluate the individual functions i and j. But it keeps you clean and able to move this information around in very highly structured ways. If you want to be creative about your indexing set, you now simply change that function, and gamma is completely unaffected. So examine what you're doing this for. Stand back and realize that what the main role of a subscript is doing is to turn a symbol, a variable a, into a function of some other variable, in this case the index i. We'd be just as right to call it a of i instead of a sub i. So the function that we're describing is on an index set i into whatever type of output we're looking for. Now I want to emphasize the word index set. All functions are defined on sets, and sets have no ordering. You can put as many copies in as you want of any element and put them anywhere you want. They don't affect the structure of being a set. And therefore, to the extent that subscripts are simply describing functions on sets, the ordering i1 through il is completely irrelevant. Order was never part of a set to begin with. And therefore, there's no ordering on indexed data. It's simply there to make humans understand how we might process it, inductively perhaps. 
but if you keep track of the induction as a separate external component of your thinking, you'll make for simpler to write mathematics, easier to program programs. Let this reality sink in, and I think the issues of subscripts will start to vanish. But let me add a huge caution. Every one of us learns best by repeating things we've practiced before. There's a lot of enormous intuition you've built up over the years by using x1 plus dot 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 plus xn. So be flexible, not only with yourself, but with others, to use a mix of notations that are appropriate for the task. But be aware, if you evolve that notation, it may outgrow your problem, and you might need to revisit some of these lessons. Take care.